I want to first start off with a big thank you. Thank you to everyone that has started following us on social media and sending us well wishes before the first episode has even aired. I'm extremely grateful for our first set of guests that agreed to be interviewed for the show before it was even launched. And thank you to you for listening. The show is really designed for two sets of individuals. The first is for the person that wants to learn about getting started in real estate investing or just loves real estate investing. You'll get to learn about the wonderful niche of house hacking. The second set of individuals that the show was made for is for those interested in improving their financial situation but don't have the desire to become a giant real estate investor. By just learning about house hacking and doing a successful house hack, you can rapidly accelerate your ability to achieve financial freedom. My name is Andrew. I bought my first home at the age of 20, and now at 37, I've been investing in real estate for over 17 years. My focus has been investing in real estate to produce passive income and long-term wealth so I can focus on what I'm passionate about. Over my years of investing, I've built up a large portfolio of buy and hold properties. I've done flips, I've raised private money, I've successfully sold off large chunks of my portfolio, I've invested out of state, I've had joint ventures, and invested in syndications. And more related to this podcast, I'm actually working on my fourth house hack right now. I'm going to use my experience over the past decade and a half to help you learn about house hacking. If you want to learn more about me, you can check out the About section on my website. I'm beyond excited for the launch of the show and been able to do this deep dive into all things house hacking. If you want a primer of what house hacking is, we've got a great article up on our site and we'll include a link in the show notes for you. For the show format, we'll be doing it by seasons, with each season having a unique format. And for season one, We're going to have 20 episodes with each episode being a unique case study of an actual house hacker. These case studies will cover what we define as five of the six styles of house hacking. They are the room rental style house hack, the income suite house hack, the accessory dwelling unit house hack, the small multifamily house hack, and the work provided house hack. Then we're going to save the sixth style, the live and flip house hack for a future season as it has its own unique set of best practices and challenges. The case studies will cover the different styles of rental options like short-term rentals, think Airbnb, VRBO, to mid-term rentals. Think about that sort of three to six month period where maybe folks will rent to traveling nurses to the typical long-term tenants. Think the standard 12-month long leases. We also made sure to feature a wide range of individuals in these first 20 case studies. Season one will feature single men, single women, couples, people that have partnered together, and of course, families with kids, all doing house hacks. We worked really hard to create an amazing first season, and we hope you enjoy it. With that said, thank you for listening, and let's get on with today's show. Across the world, people have their housing costs taken away as much as half of their income. Have you ever thought of trying to change that? The good news is there is a way. House hacking is real, and we are here to show you how other people just like you have made it happen. Welcome to the House Hacking Podcast, and here is your host, house hacking expert, Andrew Kerr. I'm excited for today's guest, Coach Chad Carson. A lot of folks that are in the real estate world have probably heard of him, but there are two things I really love about Chad. The first is, he is just a nice, genuine guy, and it's very rare to find someone that's so authentic nowadays. The second is, he's been in the real estate game since the early 2000s. A lot of folks have had success over the past five or six years investing in the market and in real estate but they've had the advantage of working in a rising market where Chad has over 15 years of real estate investing experience. He had success in the early 2000s. He survived through the Great Recession and has even had more success since then. This track record gives him so much credibility and it's these two reasons why I wanted to have him as our first ever guest on the House Hacking Podcast. So let's go ahead and bring him on. 
Well, Chad, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know we've been talking forth for a while to get you on. I'm so excited it worked out. How are you doing? Where are you calling in from? Yeah, doing great, Andrew. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And I, I'm actually in Clemson, South Carolina. So I'm my little home office here overlooking the woods and beautiful upstate of South Carolina. So it's good to be here. Oh, cool. So you're actually back in South Carolina. I know for a while you were there in Central America, right? Yeah, I was in Ecuador, right on the tip of South America, kind of the northern part of South America. So it's pretty common. Most people can't figure out where I am these days. It's like, where's Waldo or where, where's Chad? I'm like all over the place. Uh, um, but that's, yeah, I am our, our home base where my real estate is, where my business is, where I have a lot of family nearby is in uh, the, the upstate of South Carolina. Awesome. Well, I know you've just got a ton of experience in the whole real estate realm from house hacking to sort of flipping value add. But I really wanted to bring you on so you could sort of lend your experience and we could just have this intro dialogue for the kickoff episode of the house hacking podcast. So really the first question I want to ask is, you know, what does house hacking mean to you? What are all the different variations that you sort of heard of, of what is house hacking? Yeah, I love that you're going deep on house hacking because you probably know I'm, I'm such a big fan and enthusiast about this strategy. So thank you for doing that. Um, you know, for me, house hacking, if you just broke it down to the essence of what it is, it's an, al- it's an alternative strategy to turn your residence into a better investment. That's really the way I look at it. And it's got a lot of, there's a lot of different nuances, a lot of different ways you could, you could attack it. But you're basically, instead of just buying a house, moving into a place where you just, you make a mortgage payment and you live there, it's, it's, you're actually turning your home into an investment that generates income that can help you reduce your payment. They can help you build wealth. And, and so I think that, you know, if, if people think about it that way, think about it as an alternative housing lifestyle that you could either do for a few years, you could do for decades, whatever works in your life. But it's just a way to not be as stupid financially with your home. Cause a lot of people throw a bunch of money into their, into their housing, especially early in their life that, that if you look at the time value of money, that money that they're wasting, that they, they could be building wealth and it has really big repercussions, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah. And I love your definition of it. It's just making this slight different housing choice to reduce your biggest line item budget. And there's so many discussions online of forums of like, well, a house hacking is only if you do it this way or that way. And I agree with you. It's this thing of just making a slightly different choice. And that's what really got me to start this podcast. I remember it was back in the spring of 2019. I was reading a Business Insider article and it said the average American spends a third of their housing or third of their budget on housing. And then in some high cost of living areas, some people spend up to 50%. And it just blew my mind because I've done three house hacks working on my fourth. You know, I owned my first property at 20. So it just blew my mind that more people didn't think this way. Also, a lot of my network is fellow real estate investors. So it's just sort of common for us. But yeah, I love that, that, that definition there. And, you know, our case studies for this season one are going to talk about all those different variations. Uh, so thanks again for that definition. But I really want to dig into, you know, how did you get started in real estate and what drove you to do your very first house hack? Yeah, so all the way back in the beginning, I've been doing this 17 years now, almost 18 years. And so I'm 39 years old, almost 40. So when I first started, I was just, I was just getting out of college, actually. And I was sort of at a crossroads. I didn't know if I was really going to stick with being an entrepreneur or whether I was a biology major and I thought about going to med school. So I was kind of long run, just trying to decide what I'm going to do with my career. And I actually said, I'm, you know what, I'm going to go out there and try to get into real estate, see if I can flip some houses, see if I can wholesale some houses. And so I was basically going out and buying and selling, finding deals for other people, getting them under contract or buying them and then just flipping them to make a little bit of a profit to somebody else. And that, that was my you know, it was just kind of a crazy idea for me at the time because like, I, had a, I had a car, I had about a thousand bucks. I was living in my, um, my business partner's spare bedroom at the time. So I moved back up to Clemson, South Carolina, where I am now. We decided to go in business together. And you know, I, I was just, the necessity that brought me to house hacking was, was nothing like brilliant. It was nothing like, it wasn't on podcasts and forums and things like that as much, although it was a strategy I knew people talked about. It was basically this. It was, I'm an entrepreneur who doesn't have any guaranteed income. I might flip a house that makes 20,000 bucks one month and I might not make any money for six months. Like I've got to figure out a way to like cut my housing expense so that I can live on ramen noodles and, yeah, yeah. and no, no expenses. So it was, it was just sort of like a sink or swim kind of thing. I said, and, and so that's, that's how I got into thinking about, all right, how can I do this housing thing in a way that's not going to 
blow the bank and make, make me, you know, go out of business basically. All right. So you were renting a room or you're living in a room of a friend's house. That's sort of where you started or. or- yeah. Yeah. That was, that was just the free living. Like that, it would have been a, it's better than a house. <laughs> it was just my, my buddy who just let me stay in there and I, I did it for, he's my business partner today. So it worked out, but you know, I, I didn't want to push my luck. I, I was there about 11 or 12 months. And after that, I, I got to get my own place. Cause this is not, this is not going to work. And so I actually, I, I've never told this story before on a podcast or my, even on my own blog. So I wanted to, to share it. What I actually did, I usually talk, I, I usually talk about a fourplex that I ended up buying and I moved into one unit. I rented out the other three and I, I do want to talk about that in a minute, but actually I had a little interim period where I moved, I moved out of my uh, spare bedroom in my friend's house and I actually bought a house in Clemson here. Um, and I bought it with owner financing from another landlord, another investor in town. And I, I was able to buy this house. It's a three bedroom, two bath house that we still own today. Um, but we, I got it with a very low down payment. I think, I believe it was a few thousand bucks down. And, and I was able to get financing from the owner for the balance of it. And all in, I think my housing payment was probably, you know, with, with principal interest, taxes and insurance was about 700 bucks, 750 bucks a month. And I moved into one bedroom. My brother who had just graduated from college moved into another bedroom and he, he, he basically, we traded some rent for him doing some work for us. He was going out and knocking on doors and doing some real estate work for us. And so I was able to pay basically his, the, what I w- would have paid him and the job covered a little bit of that housing payment. And then I also, the third bedroom was my office, just like my business office. So it was a kind of an interim situation where I thought, all right, this will work. It's a good location. I like, I got a low down payment, but then I got into it about six or seven months later and I was like, I'm making $750 payments every month. And I, I have, back to my original situation, I don't have any guaranteed income. I might make a little bit of money now and not much money for a few months. And so I quickly decided, you know what, I, I need to, I want to buy a multi-unit property where I could actually have zero housing payment or even live for free. Yeah, And that's, that's how I transitioned into more of a true house hack after that. Okay, cool. Well, when, when you bought this single family, there's a couple of things that came up. I, I was making notes uh, and I want to just dig on on so you bought it from a pre, another landlord. Was your idea, I'm just going to live in this house? Or was this, I'll live in it and it's going to be a, a rental long term? Yeah, the second part. So I, I think, and this, this might be something that's different that you and I think of, but not other people don't. Like every house I move into, the, every, every house I've been in since then has always been thinking this could be a rental property afterwards. Um, so that, that's just my mentality. Like I, I just want to live in a property that has multiple uses. And I I really like the flexibility of that. Like, I don't want to back myself into a corner as an entrepreneur. And this probably goes back to the very beginning where you're just, you're, you're very aware that you're one mistake away from going out of business. (laughs) If you you make a bad financial move, you're done. And so I, I just like that flexibility where, all right, I'm living in this house. It's nice, but could I move out of it and rent it? and go back to my friend's spare bedroom or something yeah, or live yeah. in my car and, and just have a backup plan. And so, yeah, the, my idea with that house was I'm going to live in it for now. Maybe I can make it work, but if I can't, I'm just going to move out and rent it out. And that's exactly what I did. As soon as six, seven months later, I was like, all right, this is too much of a house for me at this point in my career. I'm just going to rent it out. And I rented it out for 950 bucks a month or no, $995 per month. And that, you know, that it wasn't a great rental property. It wasn't super cash flow at the time, but it covered the mortgage, it covered the taxes and insurance, it covered a little bit of maintenance. I was just basically breaking even on it at that point. Yeah. So when, when you found it, you found it through this other landlord that wanted to offload it. So he agreed to actually do some seller financing on it. You know, how did that actually work out? And did he offer that up front or did you ask about that? Let, let's just dig in there a little bit. Yeah. So seller financing is actually a a technique that I've used a lot over the years. And that was my first one. It was just out of a necessity, basically, where I had to, I didn't have the ability to go out to the bank and get a loan to move in because I didn't have any verified income. I was a couple years out of college. Uh, I was an entrepreneur who didn't have W2 income. And so I just wasn't a good risk for a bank at that point. And so I, I just told this, I, I talked to this, this networking with this investor. He was uh, at our local RIA group meeting, like a real estate investor association. And he, he just came up in conversation. I've got this house in Clemson. I'm in Greenville. I don't want to be I'm 45 minutes away. I really don't want to mess with this house anymore. It was an old house that I used to have. And I said, I'll buy it from you. What, what can we work out? And uh, that's, that's how the conversation started. And again, I wasn't like brilliant, knew all these strategies. I just said, well, I can't go to the bank and get a loan. I've got a few thousand bucks. Can we work something out? And he is, I think he actually came up with the idea. He's like, yeah, I'll finance it to you. 
let's talk about payments. We figured out a price and, and then we just kind of worked it backwards from there. That's awesome. You were just open, you were listening, networking with folks, and this deal came about that you were able to buy with very little cash and with seller financing. Yeah, that that's amazing. So you've obviously moved out of that property since. Have you refinanced and paid off the the original owner and gone with traditional financing since then? Yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting story because I bought the property for 120000 bucks with owner financing. <clears throat> and as it turns out, I probably paid like full price or maybe a little bit more and the house needed some work. And and so, but I went back to him a couple of years later, once I was able to qualify for a loan and it was a, from a local bank who was going to give us a loan. And I went back to him and said, Hey, do you need the cash earlier than the 10 years or whatever it was that I had, he had agreed to finance? And I said, if, if you, if, if so, I'll go ahead and pay you off. I'll get a loan, but I need, I need to pay 105,000. You know, I think I got a $15,000 discount off of what I still owed him. So whatever it was like 117 and paid down a little bit to 116 or 115, I ended up uh, paying him off at a hundred thousand dollars. And so I got a discount on the price at the time I paid him off. It was a win-win because he was able to take that cash. He had a lot of equity in the property. He took that cash and bought another property close by. And I was able to get a lower price and go to the bank long-term, long-term loan. And then we have that property as a rental today. Like I said, with that exact same loan that we used to refinance it. And the rent has gone up from nine ninety five to now it's 13 20, I think. Uh, at this point. So now it's a pretty good cash flowing property. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cash flowing better. Um, and it's in, but the best thing we've, we've looked at different properties and different, different reasons. It's almost like a chess board. If you play chess, like some, some properties are pawns, some properties are Kings or yeah. Rooks. Or whatever. And this, this one is not a cash flow generating property. It's it, I've looked at for the last 12 years, we've, we've owned this property or longer. It's basically had some good periods of cash flow and then it goes negative because we had to replace the heating and air and then it goes positive again. And so it's, it's almost break even or cash flow wise, but it, it has gone up in value to it's worth about 180,000 bucks today. And, and so we, it's, it's an appreciation play and it's a loan pay down play. And we're making money from, from the, from those two angles. We're not really making a lot of money on the cash flow. Yeah. So I, I just want to clarify one thing. You basically went to the guy and said, I've got a 10 year note with you. I'll pay you off in full this month, but I want a discount. Otherwise I'm going to stretch it out for the 10 years. Exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. Cause you can't do that with a <laughs> traditional bank, but literally you just saved yourself like 15 grand right there. It, it, and you know, and that's not a, it's not a one-time event that's happened multiple times with different pro- properties that I've bought with seller financing. And it's, it, it, it's just a question. If you don't ask that question, it's a $15,000 question and they could say, no, they could say, no, I'm happy getting the payments for the next 10 years. But they might say, I would love to have that cash because I need to pay something off or I have an opportunity here. And you've got to, you've got to ask that question. Yeah. I mean, that right there is pure gold. I mean, that can save people tens of thousands of dollars. All right. So you've been living in this single family house, going back to that time. You're like, I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I'm still grinding, hustling, don't have tons of money. This property just isn't working for me. I shouldn't be spending seven, 800 bucks a month. Is that when you decided to go to a multifamily or, you know, back then, you know, when I did my first sort of room rental house hack at 20, house hacking wasn't a thing. I mean, did you know about house hacking or how did this idea come about and what caused you to move into a fourplex? Yeah, well, I didn't know about the term house hacking because our, our friend Brandon Turner had not <laughs> invented the term. I, th- I, th- I think he's the one. I'm going to trace it back to him. But um, people have been doing this for a long time. And it, it was, again, out of necessity. And I, I'm in a college town where we just happen to have a housing stock of small multifamily properties. It's kind of fortunate that way. And so it, it turned out that there were opportunities out there. And I had a the thing that got me off the, off the bench to go do a fourplex was I, I had the idea that I didn't, this house is too much, the payment's too much. I want to get out of this thing and move out. Um, but I had a, again, a networking. I, I was talking to a, a mentor of mine who's also a private lender. He's loaned me money before. And he just, all these people in my world knew, knew that I was looking for that. And so he called me up one day and said, Hey, there's a property here in Clemson. You need to come look at it. It's, it's ugly. It needs a bunch of work. It's vacant. The ba- a bank owns it. A bank took it back. And he had talked to the bankers, a local bank who took it back. He's like, I think this might be a deal. And it, just a lesson for anybody who's listening to this in real estate, when somebody says they've got a deal and the numbers sound good over the phone and it's in your location, like, you need to drop everything and go over and see that property. That's the way deals happen. And, and that's what I did. I went over to this fourplex and took a look at it with him. And it actually had, it was, had Merry Christmas spray painted across the front of the whole building. And it, it was ugly. It was vacant. There was, there was a chalk outline of a body in unit number four. And 
Oh, like, wow. Was, well, was it just a chalk outline or was it actually really a crime scene? Yeah, nobody. I was looking for the blood drop and th- things like that. I mean, it was, it was pretty scary looking. I, and I couldn't tell if it was a joke on the chalk outline if like a, somebody just got in and wanted to play a joke on us. But it was, it was kind of a scary enough property repair-wise. It had the old 1960s carpet that, I mean, it was, I, I knew from it was going to take some work to fix it up and it was a little scary. But the vision was... I need a place to live and I, I could live here. Like this is, in, it wasn't in a horrible area. It was kind of a C, C neighborhood in town. It wasn't the best, wasn't the worst, but it was, you know, mostly renters. It was college students, but the more affordable college rentals. And, and so I just, I, I said, I got to figure out a way to buy this. And, and that's, that was the next step. Let's go talk to I went, I wanted to go talk to the lenders and my private lenders and people to help me find the money to buy this property. Yeah. So was the whole building vacant? When it was up for sale or were there still some tenants in there? It was all vacant, hundred percent vacant. Okay. And then what do you end up going under contract? So the, the contract price was 70,000 bucks. Um, they, I think they were asking 85 or, or 90, something like that. And, yeah. and so I, I came, but it was, it was a kind of, a, they call it a pocket list thing. You know, it wasn't even on the market yet. It didn't have a realtor sign in front of it, which for me are always the best deals. Um, it was just a bank had just taken the property back and my friend had happened to talk to this banker, you know, going into the bank and just chit chatting. And so I I just happened to be the first one who showed up there and I called the bank and I moved fast and I talked to the banker and said, I'm interested. I'll buy it. How can we do this? I made an offer. They made a counter offer. We ended up at 70,000 bucks and that was the the price I paid for it. I I hope you've bought many beers for that friend that that gave you that first deal. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. He, he's been, he, he's done a lot for me. There's no doubt about it. And I, I owe him a lot as well, but we've had, he's actually been a private lender for me since that time. He was a, uh, he was one of my first people who loaned me money. And to this day, he and some of his family members still, still have loans with me that we pay him 6% interest and it kind of pays for his retirement. So it's been a good deal. Yeah. That's an awesome relationship. All right. So fourplex, you're in a contract at 70 grand. How'd you actually finance it? Because did you have a traditional W2 job at this time or were you still entrepreneur, up and down income, hard to verify, hard to get a loan? Yeah, I've always been that entrepreneur up and down income. So I've never, I've never gone back to the, I've never gone to the W2 at all. So I was still, I was a little bit better off. We had a little bit more cash in the bank. We had a little bit more consistency at this point, but still in that boat. So here's what we did. We, we went to another local bank who we had established a relationship with. We had borrowed one loan from this bank on a flip property before so that we had a kind of a track record of borrowing the money, paying it off. And we went to them and said, can we get an 80% loan of the purchase price of the property? So 80% of 70,000 bucks. And then the balance will put 20% down and come up with the money to fix it up. But I was still scrappy, you know, entrepreneur. I didn't have all that money. And so I went to this private lender, the guy who brought me the deal actually, and I borrowed, I borrowed money from him um, in second position behind the bank. And we told the bank this as full disclosure. They were okay with it. And, and so some of the money to, for the down payment and the fix up came from him. Some of it came from me, from my savings. But between all of those, we kind of hacked the money to, you know, the bank, the bank loan, the second mortgage to a private lender. And then my money was, was how it ended up having to come up with about 115000 or so, 117, I think, um, was the total amount to purchase it, to fix it up, to do everything. I mean, that's an awesome way to stack your financing of bank financing, private lending, and then some of your own cash. All right. So if you were all in about the 115, I mean, you needed what, this 45,000 roughly Mm -hmm. to do the renovations and what, what type of renovations did you have to do? Or did you move in right away and then start doing work or did work first? Yeah, we had to do renovations before I could move in. Um, and so we, I still lived in the old house, you know, that we had been, I told you about earlier, but we, we, re, we changed all the windows out. We did a lot of this kind of long-term improvements that we hoped would help the, you know, the, the heating bills and the air conditioning bills. We put in new, brand new insulated windows. We painted the whole property, painted the outside, painted the inside. There were some like structural work. We had to go underneath the crawl space and fix some some places where water had been leaking in and had rotted out some some of the, the sills and the joists and things like that. So just getting the bones better, to get the insulation better. We put in central heating and air units. We put in uh, new painting, new flooring inside. New, uh, we put in new uh, dishwashers in the kitchen. Um, updated a lot of just kind of 
So when the, the end of the day you move in and it's got new flooring, new paint, new doors, new handles, new electrical outlets, new appliances. It just, it looks like a, it feels like a very nice place to, to live. And it, and, and I moved into unit number two and, and then I, as I was living there, then found uh, tenants for the other three units soon, soon after moving in. Okay. And what was the makeup of each unit? Was it a one bedroom, one bathroom, two bed, two bath? Were they townhouse style? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a townhouse style, two bedroom, one bath. So if you, if you look at the, if you imagine looking at the building, there's four front doors or along the bottom of the building yep. and then up, upstairs are all the bedrooms. And so you'd have like the, you walk in the front door, you got a little living room you got stairs off of the side to go upstairs. You got the kitchen on the back with the laundry room. And then a ba- we, we actually put back decks on there too, to make it nicer to sit outside and, and had a really nice backyard and kind of woods and a lake behind it. Um, so we just took advantage of some of the things that were there and, and made it nicer. But that, yeah, the layout of it was, was such that you, it's kind of nicer for me. Like you don't have anybody living on top of you. You just, you have somebody beside you, but you don't have anybody above you jumping up and down or doing any of that. Yeah. So why'd you pick unit two and not an end unit? It was, it was the easy, it, I figured it was going to be the hardest one to rent. And so, so that's the one I wanted to move into. Awesome. Um, you know, the, the end units I thought would be easier to rent or move more rent. So I said, I'm, I'm going to move into the one that's hardest to rent. And because the, the name of the game is make the most income, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm moving out of my, my first, my, my friend's spare bedroom. I'm living in another property. I just got out of college. I mean, there's no reason to maximize comfort and minimize your, your income at that point. That's it was the opposite was what I wanted to accomplish. Yeah. Smart choice, smart choice. So then now you're in unit two, what are the other units running for? You got these three other units. So approximately 400 bucks. I think they have a little bit under 400, but yeah, 400 bucks a piece. So we had 1200 bucks. I had 1200 bucks coming in and from those other three tenants. And so that was, it was, it was nice. I, I, in, I don't know if you want me to talk, talk about the expenses at this point, but we, we had, um, I, I, when I first bought the property, you know, I remember I had the local bank loan. I had the private lender who I was actually paying 10% interest to. So I had a high interest loan to that private lender. Um, as soon as I could, yeah, I wanted to refinance all out of all those yeah. loans. So, so I lived in the property. I got it rented. I got it stabilized. And about six months in, once I could get it seasoned, uh, all along then I was working with a mortgage broker to get me a long-term fixed 30-year kind of loan and get, to get a new appraisal on the property. And, and so what I did at that point was I refinanced and I paid off the, the local bank. I paid off the private lender and I ended up borrowing $120,000 from this on this new loan. And the reason I was able to do that was because the value of the property now with the three units rented and compare, it was the fixed up and nicer was about 155,000. So you got all you got all your cash back too. Then not only did you pay off the the first lender, the private lender, but you got your cash back and then had a little bit in there to help cover the closing costs for the refinance and stuff. Exactly. I basically just paid all of my costs off, including the holding costs, including the closing costs. It was it was a really sweet deal. As we we all know that now is a, a bur, the burst strategy. You know that you buy it, you remodel it, you rent it, you refinance, and then you repeat. You do yep. that over and over. So it was it was pretty cool that. You know, and I think this was just listening to other people and studying books and somewhere along the way, I picked that up from somebody, but it was to combine a house hack to, to add a, a burst strategy in there and then just live in it after that and have no, have no cash in it. And, and I was actually, when you, when I, at the end of the day, I would have that 1200 a month coming in and my total mortgage payment plus taxes and insurance was about 900 bucks a month, I think somewhere in there. Or not 900 to a thousand bucks. But when I added in maintenance and added a few other things, I think it was like 1100 bucks or so with so my total. You're total essentially cost. living yeah. for free. Yeah. I was, I was, I was making money or living for free and I had no cash. So I, I'd call that one a pretty good deal. Uh, I call that a really, really good deal, especially going from, <laughs> you know, living free in a friend's spare bedroom to now living free in a two bedroom, one bathroom townhouse style sort of apartment. You know, one, one thing you mentioned was seasoning. Can you explain what seasoning is and why did you say you have to be seasoned for six months? Yeah. So mo- most lenders, they're, they're risk averse. I mean, you, you think about bankers, they, they just do not want to take a risk when they make you a loan. And one of the risks of, of properties that are remodeled like this one that I did, where you try to remodel it and you try to increase the value of it, uh, the lender doesn't, doesn't want to be the first one to just loan you the money right away because that's, that's too risky. They want to make sure that everything's stabilized. They want to make sure 
that the rents aren't, you know, are, are real. They're not going away. They want to make sure that there's an appraisal on the property and that everything looks good in the neighborhood. And so it's, it's, I think, I think these are just standards from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, some of the like national lenders who own a lot of the loans out there that the seasoning requirement at that time was about six months. And they would, and so what happened was six months from the time I bought the property, my lender told me you can come back to me and get and, and get the loan at that point. So I, knowing that ahead of time, I, I worked really hard to try to get it remodeled f- fast, to get the rent in there, to get good pictures. I documented every single repair we did in the property and made a nice clean spreadsheet and had before and after pictures. And so when, when we went to get that loan, I shared that spreadsheet. I shared the, all the numbers. I shared the before and after pictures. And my, my goal was that when the, whoever the underwriter was who's going to look at this loan and give me an approval on it, they're going to look at that and say, okay, I can see how that value changed because all they're looking at at first was he bought it for 70,000 bucks and six months later, he's telling me he wants to borrow 120,000 bucks. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a great tip that you just mentioned. And I do that for all my projects. I take before photos and then I document the after. So specifically when you sit down with that underwriter and they're looking at your file, they can see why there's such a big difference in value and they see all that work you put into the property. So I just think they want to know you're not, you're not a scammer because there's some people out there who would go and borrow that money, take the money and run. And that's happened in the past. And so if you're, you're legitimate, which everybody listening to this is you know, trying to do things a legitimate way, um, you, you, you just document it, share it. And, but I think the big lesson for me in this deal was the team members, like have, having these team members, like my mortgage broker, who was, was talking to me along the way, like before, as I bought this property, I was already talking to the mortgage broker to get his feedback on, all right, how can I get a refinance on this? What can I do? What might, what would my interest rate be? And he sort of coached me along. I I didn't know all those rules. He coached me along and said, here's what you need to do. You need to make sure your credit's good. You need to make sure you get a good, good uh, tax return from from last year that we can show them you make a little bit of money. We need to make sure we get leases that show how much rent you're making. So he kind of gave me the checklist of things. And so if you're a brand new beginner, you might be overwhelmed by a lot of these steps, but if you get one or two key team team members, they they will help you as a beginner to figure out a lot of those things you need to know. Yeah, that's great. You know, one thing you mentioned your your costs were about $1100 all in with maintenance. Were there any utilities you had to pay for like the whole building, you know, was water submeter, did you have to pay water? What were some of those general utility costs that that you had to cover outside of the mortgage, taxes and insurance and obviously you know, general maintenance repairs if something breaks. Yeah, f- fortunately, all the utilities were on each each tenant, so there were no common utilities. Like some bu- buildings have like a common uh, water meter or something, or some yeah, you know, some buildings have a you know like a um, you know a common room that you have to walk into. In, in my case, the only common thing that we did pay for it regularly was we cut the grass, so we had to um, pay somebody just to come out and weed eat and cut the grass and blow the leaves off the parking lot, things yeah. like that. And then we also had a, um, a light. So the local, local utility company, you can pay like at that time is like five bucks a month for them to, to turn a light on, like on one of the light poles outside your property, just to give it. So it's not so dangerous. You know, we wanted to change the perception of what the street was like. And if you have light, if you have, it's well lit, the landscaping looks good. If people are watching out for each other, you have less of an issue of crime and, or other, other problems. Yeah. So now you mentioned you rented each of them for just at like $400 a month. Back then, how'd you actually find your tenants? And did you understand how to do tenant screening or what was sort of your, your thought process and in going into that? I was learning as I went, which is enough, to me one of the biggest benefits of house hacking. Um, I was not a landlord expert at that point. I had mainly been flipping houses. So I, I really did not have uh, an expertise in, in landlording. And But the good thing was part of the part of the landlording business is, is process. It's just understanding what the system should be, how to screen a tenant. And you can listen to podcasts like this. You can read my blog. Like I've got checklists that you can borrow on how to screen a tenant. Um, and so I did, I did do some of that. I learned from some other landlords. I asked questions, but the, the nice thing about house hacking is like you were living there. And so you, you're taking pride in this building and you're going to, some of your, your, your intuition about how to, just live there and, and attract good people is what you need to do as a landlord. So like a lot of the repairs I did um, were, were, were done to attract another tenant who I thought would take care of the building and be a, and be a good credit tenant. And so like those little extras I put into the building are part of tenant screening because you, your goal when you go screen a tenant is to get the best person you can to live in your building who will take care of it, who will stay a long time, who will pay you on time. And so I think that's often overlooked. You know, the process itself of tenant screening is a very important and there's a science to it. Um, and I learned that, um, but 
at that time, the thing I think the thing I kind of looked into as well was build a remodel a quality product, make it take pride of ownership. I, I live there. I'm taking pride in it. And I think those other tenants who prospective tenants saw that and they're like, Oh, I want to live in a place where the, the landlord is taking care of the building and he actually lives there. And so I know, you know there's not going to he's not going to be neglecting it because there's a lot of landlords out there who are slumlords, you know, they're not taking yeah. care of their properties. And so you can set yourself apart. And I found that really easy to find good tenants because of that, because you can, you can attract the right ones. And then I know that was still early on in your career. Did you know about doing leases yet? Or was it all done on a handshake of like, great, I screened you, you, you seem good. Let's just shake. And you got to give me 400 bucks every month. No, I, I did leases. I, I did the paperwork. And um, so I, I think in South Carolina, there was uh, publicly available, like a, a standard kind of rental rental agreement that I just borrowed from the, the state bar, bar association, I think. And so I, I used that. I used an application. And a lot of the, you know, today is so, e- so much easier. You can go on to, you know, online and just find a copy of a rental agreement. You can um, for sc- for screening tenants, like I, I use, uh, I recommend most people start with like something like cozy.co. That's what so I on, use. On, yeah. You know, yeah. I really like cozy. You can go online and, and you can have an application on there for, and all this is for free for you as a landlord, by the way. Um, you get an application, you send your, you send your applicants there, they fill out their information, they pay the 40 bucks or whatever it is to do their, their background check and their credit check that all comes to you with an approval or not. And it, it's so much easier. Um, at, at that point we just had to cobble together, had to find a service who would, we would get a paper application. We would fax it to them. They would, they would run their credit for us. They'd fax it back. And you're, you're giving me horrible them. flashbacks right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you believe fax machines? I mean, what? Uh, it's, so, it's such a waste. I mean, come on. Uh, but yeah, that's, it, it, I figured it out just by asking questions and networking, which today you can, you can do the same thing online. You can listen to a podcast, you can read a blog, you can go in bigger pockets and, and get a lot of the information you need. Awesome. So now how long did you end up living in that property before you moved on to your next place? So that was, I think that was about 2004 or five when I moved in there. And actually I got married in 2007. So I know I was there until 2007 because my wife moved in with me in the unit number two, like that was our, that was our first home. Um, and so we stayed there for at least a couple of years and, and that, it was really cool because, so it must've been four or five years that we lived there total. I lived there total because we, you know, I had my income. I finally got, you know, I was making more money by the time 2007 rolled around. I was able to save a lot of money because I had no housing cost. But then once my wife moved in, she had her job. She was a teacher professor at a local community college. So we added her income and she no longer had a housing payment. And we were like saving dough. (laughs) We were saving a lot of cash at that point because we had such a solid foundation of having no housing costs. And then we added, we kept on making more and more money. And so that was probably like the prime, um, you know, for us, like the amount of time we just saved a ton of money. And we still to this day have the compounding of of a lot of that savings that we made. Well, that's why I love it when people do house hacks early on, because if you just put that money away and start investing it in your 20s, it just compounds for decades on. All right. So you mentioned you got married and your wife moved in. What did she think back when you were dating of like, oh, is this some future real estate mogul? I, you know, I'm, I'm locking them down. Or was it like when I was dating, uh, who who's now my wife? It's like, oh my God, Andrew's doing this weird real estate thing. He's buying these properties. Tenants are calling them at all hours of the day and night. I mean, what was that sort of dynamic like? Yeah, I, I probably need to ask her and get her on the show sometime to give like the real answer. But my 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 memory of this was that she was a little skeptical of me. Um, just the background story: she was like more into like Sierra Club and going camping, and more like capitalism is like not really that good a thing because it pollutes it pollutes everything and it's it runs over people. And so we we had a little interesting conversations about you know, capitalism, bad capitalism, good. Here I am a capitalist, you know, trying to make money. And, and it was, it was fun because we both learned a lot from each other. And I feel like her, her passion for people and for giving back and for, you know, taking it easy in life a little bit and not just always working, working, working has been a nice, has been a nice foil to my like ambitions type A, let's go, let's make, let's make this thing happen. And, um, but at that time though, I think her intuition was I like to save money too. She was very, you know, we, we would, for fun, we would go camping and hang out in a tent, you know, in the woods and go hiking and cheap dates. Um, yeah. Really cheap. Yeah. Dates. Yeah. So she, she, I, I was just, I just hit the, like the, the lottery <laughs> in terms of that. Cause she, she was the things she enjoyed doing you know, were like the things I enjoyed doing camping, playing sports, ultimate Frisbee, 
you know, whatever. And it just wasn't expensive for So I think moving into a nice, efficient place where she didn't have to pay any rent and we, we can together make this, you know, just live there. That was, that was a natural, natural transition for her. Yeah. That's awesome. It worked out so well. I mean, so thinking back through that period, what do you feel like your biggest success was with moving in to the house or I guess from the friends extra room to the house to now actually a house hack? Well, I mean, you already mentioned it. I think that the first big success was I was able to save a bunch of money. Um, so you know, it, it, it started this conversation out saying I just did this by necessity because I didn't want to fail. Like yeah. I just, I just didn't, I didn't want to get out of the business and that's really what it was all about. But as, as you find success and as your career grows and as you start making more money, which if you, in most careers, if you're reinvesting yourself and getting better, you should start making more money. That's one of the goals you should have. Um, and for me, you know, I had that fixed housing cost, which you, you already mentioned is 30 to 50% of most people's budget. I had, I didn't have that. Like I, I had 30 to 50% of the money I made was going straight to savings. Like it was just me building wealth, working towards financial independence at that point. And so that, that was like big success, number one. But then there was a, a second success, which I didn't realize at the time that has made a big difference now, 17 years later, was I actually, we, the, the niche of student housing has become our main thing. Like it's, it's some of our most successful rental deals later on were based upon the, the fact that I kind of lucked into this fourplex or just, you know, I stumbled upon it, so to speak. And what I learned from renting to those grad students, there's a lot of more international grad students, really good tenants and wonderful people. We, we established a niche of doing those same kind of rentals over and over and over again, even this year. Like, so that was 2004, 2019. Now, you know, we just bought a 16 unit building, not too far from there. And it was, we, we were confident in, make, in buying that, brought, that building. We know the numbers really well because they're very similar to my fourplex, you know, to the yeah. one we bought in the beginning. And so I've, the knowledge we acquired at a very low risk of buying that fourplex has compounded itself into us having a lot of properties that, that produce enough income for us not, have to, not to have to go work a job anymore. Yeah. Well, the one thing I really love that you said was that first part where, you know, I think house hacking is a great way to dip your toe into real estate investing if you want to be a real estate investor. But if you have any desire just to save money, or if you want to be an entrepreneur, do a house hack, even if you never want to do any more real estate investing, just having that free place to live makes it so much easier to be an entrepreneur or start that business that you've been dreaming about when you don't have to worry about that 30 to 50% of your budget going towards housing costs. That's great. And I love how it also developed this niche for you of student housing. You know, if, again, thinking back through that same period, you know, what was your sort of biggest challenge or if there's something now that you're a super successful real estate investor, tons and tons of units, now looking back, could you say like, oh, you know, Chad, I really messed up at that. I'd do that that part again or change change something. What what would you change if you could? It's a really good question. Um, I think related to that building, I probably wouldn't do a lot different. Uh, it, it worked out well. I, I think, but parallel to that, maybe I'll just tell this story, is at the exact same time I was living in that building, we were also getting very aggressive in 2007, you know, buying, buying a lot of properties. And so, you know, kind of historical context here, Hopefully everybody remembers 2008, nine and 10 where the great recession, the real estate market was kind of the center of that. It tanked. Um, and we, we were flipping, we, we, we bought, we had 35, 33 closings in 2007 where we were, a lot of them were buying and flipping. Some of them were very quick, made a lot of money on them. But then we also bought a lot of rentals and we got, we got over aggressive is, is the, the main point. And I think that was a challenge. That was a mis, a mis, some of those properties we bought not all of them. Some of them were a mistake because we just, we got, uh, we ran the numbers a little bit too casually or too loose. We didn't estimate all the repair costs we needed. We didn't estimate uh, rental income, rental expenses the way we needed to. We had some with negative cash flow. So I, I don't think that was a cause of house hacking, but I think maybe I, you know, I got pretty comfortable and I got, had a foundation there. And I, I think I would just would, should have been a little bit more okay with plotting along, doing the deals fine, being like, owning whatever my process was and not trying to feel like I had to do get bigger and do more. And I think that's really prevalent in the real estate investing space. Like you're not successful unless you do, you go big or go home, you know, Grant yeah. Cardone kind of stuff. And he might be a nice guy. We'd have fun over beer talking, but I have a, I have a problem with kind of the, saying that's successful when there, I know a lot of people, some of the most successful people I know in terms of lifestyle and living the life that you want 
have five properties or 10 properties and this, they're, they're very simple and it's almost like a minimalism of, of, of business. And I think that's the challenge I had at the point, at that point. And luckily we would live to see it, you know, live to see the other side of it. We did, we were able, and a lot of it because of house hacking, because I had my expenses low and didn't spend a lot of money. But I think that challenge um, informed a lot of the philosophy I have now about business and what I try to teach other people and share with other people that it's okay to like go small or go home. Like don't, don't feel like you got to like take over the world you know, find a, find a place that you're comfortable with, find a goal that you're comfortable with and own it. And don't worry about, you know, trying to compete with everybody else. I, I love that you mentioned that because that's one of the things I, I is really turned me off <clears throat> in a lot of the forums online is you're not successful unless you own 50 units or a hundred units or a thousand units. You know, I got up to just at 40 units in 2016. And then I was like, you know, this really isn't for me. I love real estate investing, but I don't want to self-manage dozens and dozens of units. I, what I ended up doing was selling off everything and then investing in syndication deals. And I love that niche. It's less work for me. I still do house hacks and manage those couple units when it's a house hack that I'm living in. But I love that you mentioned that and you sort of found what's the right number for you. And I, I love that part of it. You know, my, my really sort of last question here is your wife moved in with you to that house hack. Did you, the two of you do another house hack or would you ever do another house hack again? So we, we have continued to evolve our house hacking strategy, but we, we decided to have a family. And so we wanted to have kids and we thought the little two, 700 square foot townhouse, as much as I love it. And I'm kind of nostalgic for going back to that, that simple lifestyle. We said, well, we probably need to move up and get a little house. It's a little bit bigger. So the American, the American uh, move up. But I was, in, I was at this point, I was aware of how successful house hacking and that strategy is. And so instead of just buying, just buying any old house, we bought a, a house that was a fixer upper, first of all, and we moved into it. We got a good deal on it and we, we lived in it without renting it to any roommates. So like that was the deal. Now we got a family and we got to put the kids in another place, but we did again, think about the fact that when we move out, we're going to rent this place out. And so it's, it's something we learned from house hacking. I, I call that a, a live in and then rent. Yep. Um, so live in it. You know that from the very beginning, this is eventually going to be a rental, but you live in there for a couple of years, which we did. And then we actually moved to another house after that. And, and, and so that, that other house um, that we, is one we're in now. So we had, we had a, a one house in between our fourplex and where I am now. And it's now, it's, it's, it's currently a rental that my wife and I own outside of our business. So we, we own that one together. It's a great rental and a good location. And we moved in the house we're in now. We can kind of continue that process. We, we have not rented this one out until now this year, actually, we have a, we have a basement apartment and we were just looking at it. We're like, this is such a big house. You know, we have 1900 square feet upstairs. I'm not, I used to have my office downstairs, but that's just more than I need. And so we decided to turn it into an Airbnb for game days in Clemson because we're a football town. We're college football and it's really big. And, and so we remodeled it, put some money into it. And then we've been renting it out just for the, for the weekends, whenever there's a home football game and making really good money from that as a, so that's, we've evolved into another house act here, yeah. but we're doing, we're doing it with short term rentals instead. Awesome. Yeah. I love your whole story. And thanks for sharing some of these tidbits that aren't out there on your website and other podcasts. And I just can't thank you enough for being on the show, but before sure. we let you go, what we want to do at this point and what we're going to do for the rest of the season one guests is Ask them a set of final six questions that we like to call the famous six. All right. So question one, what is your favorite personal finance blog, book, or podcast? Oh, that's a tough question because I've got a lot I like a lot that I like. Um, yeah, I think I'll go old school in the book. I, your money or your life was sort of the one. Um, that really got me into the financial independence mindset. I, I had been into the real estate investing space. I'd been into, I mentioned earlier, buying a lot of properties and flipping a lot of properties. But when I read Your Money or Your Life, it was the most clear kind of vision of the fact what money really is doing for you in your life. And I remember there was a certain graph they had in the book where they showed that the more money you make and the more stuff you get, you get happier and happier at first. And then you hit this like peak where you have enough yeah. And when you have enough, when you get on the other side of enough, it starts going like the more stuff you get, the less happy you get because you got to manage this stuff and you got to, you got to wash the boat and you got to take care of these cars and you're worried about losing stuff. And so that was, it was a really philosophical book about money that your money or your life was um, kind of changed my mindset about things. And I always recommend that one. Awesome. All right. So on to question number two, what's your favorite real estate related blog book or podcast? 
I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna give a little, little twist on this one. I haven't been reading as many real estate investing, just pure books lately. Although I like a lot of the bigger pockets books. Um, they publish my book. So that was like that a lot. You got to give them a little a plug for that. Yeah. Right. I got, they, I got a little plug. Yeah, they, <laughs> they, they've been, they've been a, they're a great resource, but I want to talk about another book. This kind of been an interest of mine called strong towns. Um, now Str- strong towns is not directly about real estate investing, although it's kind of a piece of that pie. It's, it's about uh, cities, about local communities and, and how to build strong towns. And I think if you're a real estate investor, this has become an involving interest of mine is how, how cities work and how zoning works and how, how healthy towns really work and how, and, and this book talks about a lot of towns that their finances aren't good and why they're not good and why development patterns affect that. So if, if you want to understand the fundamentals of what makes a city a good city or a town a good town, and it's, it's really interesting. Strong Towns is a pretty cool, cool book to read. It's a new one out by Chuck Marone as the author. Awesome. I'm going to add that to my reading list. And then number three is what has been your favorite travel destination so far? The, the one that's freshest on my mind is Cuenca, Ecuador. And so I, 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 I've been to a lot of different places, but Cuenca, Ecuador is where my wife and my two kids who are now six and eight years old, we lived there for 17 months a couple of years ago. And it was just an amazing experience. A lot of the things we've talked about today, real estate investing made that possible, the income that it was producing. But just being there with them, my kids learned Spanish. I was able to improve my Spanish. We lived in another culture. We got to have friends there. Um, just overall for just having doing that whole thing together and traveling together as a family was a very enriching experience. Yeah, that's amazing. So then what's next on your travel list? That's a uh, question four. We've always got a, l- a list of things we want to do. I, th- I think we're going to, we have some friends who are in uh, Spain right now and we've, we love Spain and we've been there in the past before we had kids. And so we'd like to go back there with our kids. So I think we'll be probably flying them probably next summer. 2020, we're planning on going to fly into Madrid and then go to, maybe go to Galicia, which is a kind of nor- northwestern state of Spain. Looks a lot like Ireland, actually, very green, rolling hills, and but it's where the the Camino de Santiago is a big trail, a uh, kind of pilgrim path in Spain. That's really cool. Ends in Santiago in that part of Spain. So, so how's your Spanish? Is it more Central American Spanish or more of that like Catalan, very more proper Spanish Spanish is what some folks from Spain refer to it as? Yeah, no tengo acento castellano. No, I, <laughs> I speak, I think, I think I've got more of the Peruvian, Ecuadorian, although my, I'm, I'm gringo. I'm, I just speak like a gringo. I don't have yeah. any real, my wife is a little confusing to people though because she's from St. Louis, looks like, you know, you know, Western European, but then she speaks and she speaks very well. And she's like, they'll, they'll look at her like, are you, are you from South America? Are you from Spain? Like she's because she learned to speak Spanish in Spain. So she confuses them a little bit. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So number five, what's the biggest item on your bucket list that you haven't accomplished yet? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it's more about giving back at this point. Uh, I, I'm really excited about earning money still, but I, I've kind of got to the point that not that I have enough, but I'm, you know, I have, a, I have more things I want to do with my real estate business, but we've hit a pretty good plateau and I'm actually excited about building, continuing to make money, but then using a, a portion of that money to donate it to things that I think are important. And I've been donating a lot of my time in my local community to try to build uh, trails and sidewalks and bike paths that I think will help to make the community better. And I want to do the same thing with money. So I, I actually have a I don't think I've told anybody this one publicly either. I have a, I have a goal to give away a million dollars and I, I don't know if it's going to be over. I'm kind of playing around with it. I don't know if it'll be in, in really ambitious and try to do it in like 10 years or whether I want to do it in 15 or 20 years. But I, I, I just, I like the idea of like, we all want to be millionaires and make yeah. a bunch of money. And I'd like to do the same thing with, with giving and see how much can I make in my business so that I can give away a bunch of money too. Yeah, that, that's amazing that you brought that up. I think it's such an integral part of life of actually giving back. And, you know, I originally started in the mortgage industry and then went to the nonprofit sector. And that's why I kept doing the real estate side of things is to grow the long-term wealth. And that way I could live off of the nonprofit salary. And, you know, everyone knows nonprofit folks don't get paid well. So I've that's had right. this goal of raising $25 million for charity. I think I'm up to like 17, $18 million. And, and wow. that's my goal is to raise 25 million for charity. But then the other thing that my wife and I've really started looking at is setting up a donor advised fund. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's some years 
our real estate income goes up and down. Like some years we do incredibly well on the real estate side when we have a flip or a longer term property that we end up liquidating. So we're actually looking at setting up a donor advised fund when we sell a, a property early uh, next spring. So maybe that's something you can start to look at is start funding that, teach your kids yep. about giving and help you get to that million dollar uh, goal of giving away money. But I think that's an amazing goal you have. Well, we, we'll have to have some follow-up chats on that, Andrew, because I definitely am interested in that and I've read a little bit about that donor advised fund, but I think that's such a cool, cool idea that we can, we can exchange some ideas on back and forth. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm happy to help on that. All right. So number six and the final question, what is your favorite life hack? Is this cheating to say it's, it's house hacking? <laughs> <laughs> that, it's I mean, a good one. That's a good financial life it, hack. Yeah. Yeah. It can't, it can't, doesn't get much better than that. Um, but, but I, I will add, um, geo arbitrage is one that, uh, is, is really fresh in my mind because we lived in Ecuador, as I mentioned earlier, and just by changing your location, sometimes within the United States or within your country, sometimes going across the globe, um, you can live like a king with a much smaller amount of money. Uh, and that's, that's geo arbitrage is you're, you're using dollars that have a certain value in one country. And then you come to another country where maybe the cost of fruit, for example, we, we would go to Ecuador to the market and for 20 bucks, we would come home like with our bags bulging full of like fruits and vegetables and things that would cost us 150 bucks back in the, the mar same market in the United States. So I think if, if you have flexibility of your time and your location, it's a lot of fun to think about that hack of how, where can I live and maybe like have financial independence right now instead of having to wait 20 years to do it. Well, as a little teaser, we've got a guest coming up in a later episode, uh, Brooke, who is doing house hacking and she's using geo arbitrage. I actually did the interview with her from Mexico City and then she went on to Havana, Cuba. So it's, I, I love geo wow. arbitrage. Me <laughs> and my wife have been looking at it. We're huge travel buffs. Yeah, I, I think it's an amazing life hack. So yeah, that, that's an awesome answer right there. Great. <laughs> Well, Chad, thank you so much again for being on the show. Uh, for everyone listening on the show page, we'll actually link to Chad's book, his blog, that checklist he mentioned for screening tenants and all his social media links so you can follow him. Definitely check out his blog. I've learned a ton from his blog as well. So thank you again for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me as a guest on the season. I think you're, I can't wait to listen to the rest of the episodes. This is going to be great. Thank you for listening to the House Hacking Podcast. For more up-to-date information on house hacking, to access links and resources mentioned in today's show, and connect with a guest and host, head over to www.fibyrei.com. That's www.fibyrei.com, where your house hacking journey begins.